fictions like the uh, Iron Man and uh, you know the Iron Man suit, right? And uh, before I kind of like, uh, um, kind of like, uh, go through the uh, variable robot, uh, I just want to ask the uh, everyone: Do you have any uh, questions about this or suggestions about uh, the, the the syllabus? Do, do you want to uh, hear more other topics? Um, so, so the idea uh, for the syllabus is that we want to you to have both system like a, a big picture about a, those kind of a very popular uh, robots. Do you see how you started recording? Yes, I have started recording. Yes. Okay. You already did or you just started? Uh, I did it another 30 seconds before. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, um, so the uh, so uh, the, uh, the idea is that we want you to understand uh, state of the art in robotics. So that's the one uh, major uh, kind of like a of this course. So that's why we cover a variable robot, soft robots, and uh, some like a, a reconfigurable uh, modular robots. Um, another idea is that we want you to uh, understand, uh, uh, gain some knowledge, right? Some skill sets. What, why is knowledge like a variable robots? Those are, I, I call this knowledge. The second category is a skill, right? And uh, like uh, um, how to pro, uh, do the Arduino programming, uh, communication, motor control. So this, those are kind of like a hands-on skills. So you, you both understand the big picture and also you can learn something new. So that, that's uh, um, the, the goal of, uh, of this uh, um, uh, course. Yeah. Um, uh, do, do you have any question? Uh, by, by the way, is the screen sharing clear? Looks clear from you? Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do, do you have any question or suggestion? Okay. Uh, if you don't have, don't have any suggestion, so I, I, um, what, uh, what one kind of uh, suggestion from myself is uh, uh, now we, we plan to have uh, you folks to present, for example, uh, student presentation here, right? And then you will present uh, about uh, what you learn from soft robot, uh, like actuator, right? So that's uh, uh, one plan. Uh, another option is, uh, so, so I think this is something, uh, I, I feel like a um, kind of like a flipped classroom, right? So it's not only I keep talking, right? You also could be more um, engaged by you present uh, some stuff there. Um, uh, another option, I, I'm still thinking, is uh, you can present something, uh, for example, uh, you can present some like a medical uh, devices uh, or medical robots. So there's a, um, uh, for example, there's a, um, a, a medical uh, surgical robotic company in North Carolina, and uh, you can present uh, uh, the the the, um, the technical background of this company, and uh, also. You can give some kind of like a valuation. Um, it's kind of like a you know stock market <laughs> valuation. Um, how much this company worth, right? The the value of this company, and you can use um, what I teach in this uh, course to have some presentation about uh, about those kind of like companies. And uh, there are like a um, uh, how. I have thought, uh, have, uh, thought about uh, several companies. One is a sensor company. Then they, uh, they do uh, glucose uh, monitoring. It's called a continuous glucose monitoring uh, sensor. So it's an implantable sensor. And um, so this, this, this is a, uh, one company. Another company is a surgical robotics co company. They, they make uh, minimally invasive surgery, uh, a surgical robots. So you, you can, uh, go to their website, go to YouTube, and do your homework. And I will also give you uh, maybe two or three papers, and you can check what they do. So those are so so th th this is a, the first option, right? And uh, you present uh, the um, uh, basically what um, uh, the, the left column. The second option is you can present uh, about uh, uh, it's kind of like a due diligence. It's called a DD due diligence. You do your due diligence um, uh, uh, with the several companies and check uh, if this company is a really good company or, or, 
or it's OK company, right? How much uh, is their value? Uh, I just want to take a quick pool for students. I think um, for the second one, I think like uh, uh, the cool part about that is uh, you can um, use the knowledge, right? The knowledge I teach you, right? I, te I will teach you about the center and you can use this knowledge. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> cool. So the, the second option, like uh, this, uh, for example, this uh, uh, sensor company, uh, surgical uh, robot company. Uh, also, there's some like a uh, 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 heart uh, assist. So a uh, cardiac, cardiac assistance. Uh, so it's uh, like a uh, several products from several companies, and you can present that. So I, I call this uh, option A and option B. So I just want to take a quick pull. Um, do you prefer um, presentation about uh, option A or option B? We can certainly also do a, a combination. For example, maybe by, by, by this week, maybe for the first uh, uh, presentation, you can present those. And for the, uh, the next, uh, maybe that's, uh, uh, I just want to take a quick pull and simply, simply do you prefer presentation uh, content A or content B? Can, can you maybe type your preference in, in the chat box? Uh, indifferent, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what about others? Okay. Um, I have a question, how often would each student be presenting? Uh, I think uh, we formed uh, teams, right? Uh, so I think it's uh, based on uh, a team. I think, uh, uh, for, um, for example, each student will join one team, then you will uh, only present, I think, once or twice. Yeah, overall. Yeah. OK. So uh, um, yeah, um, any other? OK. It looks like everyone prefers uh, A. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I will uh, like uh, uh, follow the our original plan. But the point I want to make is uh, um, uh, actually the knowledge you learn is could be very useful, right? Uh, uh, does any of you do stock investment? Me, me, do yeah. So, so, so I think uh, um, the, the reason I want to bring this up is, uh, okay, cool. I think a few students probably uh, do stock investment, right? So um, the, the point I want to make is, uh, uh, and the engineers, right? You learn uh, like a, a lot of like uh, engineering principles, methods, and like a, both math and the engineering kind of like a, um, a skill sets, right? The point I want to make is uh, those skill sets, uh, could be uh, actually very, very useful and uh, will help you to determine, uh, make a lot of judgment, right? No matter you pursue different career uh, uh, after your undergrad degree, right? No matter you, you stay in engineering, you go to do business or do investment. The point I want to make is that this could be super uh, useful uh, because uh, um, what do you learn? What, what, what what you learn is not only, for example, the soft robot, right? It's not only the soft robot itself. I think uh, um, the, the, the important piece that uh, you learn uh, 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 as uh, uh, students, what, 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 uh, what do you think is very important? For, 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 uh, what do you learn in the four years in, in college? What, what's kind of most important you think? Uh, you can unmute yourself if you want to, yeah. Can some of them maybe say something, say, say a few words? What's the most important thing that you want to learn in the next uh, three or four years? Um, to use knowledge to solve problems. Uh, can I see you? Is that Steve, right? Yes. Okay, I, I, I can... What, what about other students? Any 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 other ideas? So so my my so this is like a engineering one one right? 
And I want to make this course uh, more interactive, right? And uh, so you can think about something. Um, because honestly, if, if I go back to, to when I was a freshman, I feel like many knowledge island is not very useful. And I actually forgot uh, many, <laughs> many uh, stuff I, I learned there. So what was actually useful for you to pay the tuition or, or spend your time to learn? So, okay, still said uh, knowledge, what else? Uh, just basic communication skills. So you cool. can work yeah, better yeah. That's a good with, like, an interactive yeah. team. Yeah, that's Specifically, a good point. Yeah like on coding projects, if you're working with someone else, yeah, it's very useful. Cool, yeah, I think that's a good point. So uh, I would say uh, there are several aspects. I think uh, uh, generally there are two categories of stuff I think you can learn. One is like a, uh, like a um, technical, right? That, that's uh, one category. The second category is a uh, non-technical -te uh, stuff. I think, uh, 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 to, to be uh, really make your learning really valuable, I think uh, it's better you learn both, right? And uh, to me, I feel like uh, um, it's certainly important that you learn those kind of, uh, uh, let me see, um, technical, right? And uh, non-technical. So technical, uh, for example, like a, um, uh, like a communication, right? Communication. Non-technical is, for example, we talked about the Arduino, right? Arduino, right? The C programming, right? Yeah. So, so those could be. But uh, another uh, kind of like a very important point I want to uh, you to realize is a uh, um, is kind of like a uh, I would say logic and uh, critical uh, thinking. So those are, could be, you know, those could be, maybe they are considered non-technical, right? But uh, uh, I, I think uh, um, the technical, so let's say the, the, the first category is technical, right? The second category is non-technical, right? So I think the technical help you to solve a problem, right? So, so the, if I, let me, uh, the technical stuff help you to solve some problem, but the non-technical content could, uh, I think in some sense is uh, um, as important as the technical. Um, like a mystical mentioned like a communication, right? This, uh, uh, one item, right? The second item I mentioned here is the logic and uh, critical thinking. That means uh, it's not only to solve a problem, right? Also, I think it's more important to what a problem to solve, right? To think about the problem you, you need to solve, right? So yeah, it, it's like uh, after, you, after you graduate, right? You probably need to think about, uh, do you want to go to pursue a master degree? or do you go, want to go to work, right? So those kind of like, a, the, it's not about a what, it's also, uh, it's, not, it's not about how. The first one kind of like uh, answer you how to solve the problem, right? The second uh, have you to uh, think about what is the problem, right? So, so I think uh, really think about the, um, both technical and non-technical and uh, really think about uh, uh, from logic, uh, critical thinking perspective, can really make yourself different from other, right? So yes, we are engineers, but uh, you, before you solve a problem, you, you want to think about uh, what's the problem, right? And uh, really think about, uh, um, you know, make a good judgment before you jump to solve some uh, technical um, uh, challenges, right? Any question? Okay, so uh, yeah, so let, let, let's uh, uh, like a start with uh, today's uh, kind of like a technical content. And uh, uh, first I will talk about uh, um, uh, why software robot, right? Why wearable robot? 
and uh, then we will talk about uh, uh, what is a, a wearable robot, right? And uh, what's the best wearable robot? So we will talk about some kind of like a control. So the first section is kind of like a design or robotics. The second is a control or robotics, right? So that, that's kind of like the general idea. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, I, I, uh, in the last uh, uh, two decades, I think we have uh, witnessed a lot of like uh, uh, progress in information uh, technology, right? Uh, almost uh, um, everyone has a smartphone and uh, uh, smart devices, like a smartphone um, is uh, almost uh, ubiquitous, right? And uh, which is the interface between human and the cyber world, right? Um, between human and the internet and uh, uh, yeah. So this is a kind of like a uh, cell phone uh, as an interface, right? Interface, interface between uh, human and uh, uh, you can see the internet or the cyber world, right? The internet. So this is the interface between human, right? A human here. And this is the, uh, I consider a uh, cell phone as the information interface, right? It's an information interface, right? Um, the vision is in the, in the, not only in the near future or even currently, we want, we, we, there's a not much progress about a physical interface, right? Um, physical interface, right? And uh, robot is a great platform to provide a physical interface to uh, have a kind of like a, some kind of like a interface between human and the physical world, right? And uh, think about the, uh, uh, for, for example, this robot, right? Um, in the interface between human, right? And uh, uh, the physical world that, uh, for example, uh, this uh, person want the robot to grab uh, some beer from uh, the, uh, the Xbox, right? So this, this uh, uh, is one um, scenario about uh, the interface, right? And even the person himself is a part of the physical world, right? Um, maybe um, the robot can help the person to uh, lift his arm, right? And uh, lift him off the bed, right? So the, the, the user, human itself, is also part of the physical world, right? So robot is the interface between human and the physical world, right? So this robot, this robot as a physical interface is something uh, is still not a very common and, uh, but it holds a great promise because uh, it's very unique because this one only, provide, only provides information interface, right? If, uh, uh, if you want the role, if you want something, right? to have you to, uh, to open the door, right? The, the cell phone can not really do that, right? And if something happened in your home, but you, you are away, you want the, 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 the something, right? To have you to maybe to uh, turn off the, the gas, right? Something physically to manipulate the world, right? And uh, normally um, it will be a robot to do this, right? And uh, information, a cell phone, can only have about a, uh, information communication, right? But not really have you to uh, uh, change the physical world, right? Can, can, can you give a, another example, a robot that has a physical interface to change the world, change the physical uh, environment? It might be a little cynical, but like the first thing that comes to mind is a drone. Yeah. Or military wise, because they're usually first in those advancements. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think a uh, uh, drone is also a great example, right? And um, it it, uh, uh, it can provide information, right? And uh, but but uh, this information, for example, if you have a drone, 
this information cannot uh, be uh, provided by, uh, like, for example, by a cell phone, right? Because uh, um, the, the drone can provide you this information because it's mobility, right? So it's also kind of like, a, uh, it's not directly interacting with the physical environment, right? But it's a kind of like, a, uh, it has navigation in the physical environment, right? So this is uh, um, actually a great example, right? The, the physical environment, not necessarily to have physical interaction, right? So you can have an interaction uh, like this uh, um, robot, or you can have no interaction, but because the mobility, uh, all the manipulation, uh, uh, obviously manipulation, there's the interaction, right? But for mobility, there's no interaction, right? So, um, but the problem is most uh, robots are actually designed for, uh, most robots are actually rigid, right? It's made of like a metallic components and uh, it's very rigid and uh, still very dumb, right? You see the robot almost has no intelligence. So we want to enable a paradigm that uh, uh, we want the robot to be soft and uh, also uh, it can be operated uh, as a force control, right? Because uh, when you interact with the physical world, force is more uh, critical than the position, right? Um, uh, for example, you, you can think about, uh, um, um, for example, if you pr press against the wall, right? Let's say if uh, this is a glass, right? If you press against the glass, or if, if you press against this kind of like a, um, a traffic uh, uh, cone, right? They have different uh, mechanical property. And the, the position, if you move like a one millimeter, right? Um, in this case, the one millimeter for glass could be generated 10 Newton, right? And if you move one millimeter uh, for a very soft, uh, like a, a soft component, like a cheese, right? You, you probably only get like a, a two Newton, right? So think about it, it's kind of like a spring, right? One is a very stiff spring, the other is a very soft spring, right? So you only move a single, the same amount of um, position, but you get a different like a uh, force, right? So that's why the position control is not really uh, useful uh, for interaction with the physical world. So we really care about the false information, right? So that, that's why we talk about the force here. Uh, as a robot, it has those like four important components, uh, actuator, uh, sensor, uh, robot itself, like, the, the, like for example, the, the, the arm of the robot, right? And the actuator typically is kind of like a motor. Uh, sensor is something, for example, we, we measure the position uh, or measure the force of the robot, right? And the uh, um, robot is a kind of like a third component that uh, is a physical uh, embodiment of the robot itself. And we also need uh, like a kind of controller, right? And uh, this, uh, uh, in general, we can also call this AI, right? To make the robot really smart. So those are kind of like a, a four components of a robot system. Uh, in my lab, we focus on uh, kind of like a, um, a, a biomedical uh, uh, like a, a robots and uh, we, we, we learn medicine and also we design uh, bio-inspired robots. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, the application in my lab uh, uh, includes like a, a human augmentation, like an Ironman uh, type of human augmentation also uh, re re rehabilitation. Um, if, you, if you think about it in the continuum care, um, the, 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 it, it covers, um, the continuum care uh, starts from like a disease prevention, uh, diagnosis, uh, disease treatment, uh, uh, disease recovery, and also uh, home care, right? This is called uh, the continuum of care. Uh, in my lab, we work on like um, uh, soft exosuits uh, for uh, muscular skeletal injury prevention. Uh, we also uh, study um, image guided um, surgical robots. Uh, in this case is a uh, MRI guided robot for prostate uh, biopsy. Uh, also um, image guided uh, neurosurgical robots for tumor treatment. Um, we, um, th those are kind of like, uh, the surgical robots. And uh, we also study like a variable robots for human um, like augmentation and also uh, rehabilitation. Yeah. 
Um, um, more specifically, we have developed like, in my lab. We developed the uh, uh, most lightweight motor and uh, the most lightweight uh, salt actuator, and uh, built leveraging those components. We also designed the most lightweight uh, powered exoskeleton, and uh, um, we also study kind of controller um, that can be used uh, for real world applications, right? So, so actually, most robots. And you can see from this uh, the, the, the video, right? Actually, they, they, they are kind of like a, uh, not, not really de designed for real world application, right? M most robots are still uh, only limited in lab settings, right? If, yeah, even if you come to my lab, yeah, it takes so much time for the student to actually get it up and running, right? It's kind of like a very friendly of the robot, right? Yeah. Uh, and in terms of scientific discovery, uh, our vision is that uh, we want to enable this uh, uh, clinic or lab-based uh, rehab to home uh, uh, community-based uh, rehab, right? And a major uh, goal uh, of wearable robot is to reduce uh, energetics during uh, human locomotion. Uh, for example, during walking, we want uh, people to consume less energy if you can wear a, a robot, yeah. Uh, uh, in the last uh, about uh, like 10 or 20 years, uh, there are dramatic uh, uh, progress uh, in wearable robots, uh, like an exoskeleton to help people uh, who are fully paralyzed to regain mobility so they can walk again. Uh, also, uh, like a robotic uh, prosthesis that uh, um, are for peop uh, 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 people who have uh, amputation, and so uh, they have no limbs. And so with those uh, robotic processes, uh, they can also walk again. Um, yeah, because without this, they can only rely on some like uh, uh, unpowered uh, devices. What, so why is it called exoskeleton? The other is called a processes. Do you know what's the difference? How can you tell it's an exoskeleton or it's a prosthesis? Um, uh, this is a guess, but exoskeleton. I mean, for post for prosthetics, it's like attached to some to some place that has like no limb. While exoskeletons are like over the existing limb. Yeah. Okay. In this case, there's still limb, right? In this case, there's no limb. No, no limb means, for example, that there's no uh, ankle joint, right? For example, here, right? He, he has no ankle joint, right? Um, he has like a, a knee joint and hip joint, but doesn't have the, the ankle joint, right? So, so in this case, um, the robot is uh, um, kind of like in, in, in uh, robot in theories to the residue limb. Is in theories, right? So if you think about the, the, the ro robot here, and this is the residue limb, right? So they are kind of like in theories. But in this case, if you think about the, let's say this is the robot, this is the, uh, the limb, right? No limb, I mean, no this limb, right? <laughs> no ankle, right? But there's still residue limb, right? So uh, if you think about the residue limb, right? In this case, right? But, uh, but, uh, um, uh, in this case, this is a robot, right? The person still have the, all the limbs, right? So it's in parallel to the residue limb, right? So kind of like in parallel, right? So it's attached in parallel to the person, right? So this is kind of like a, a kind of like a, a parallel configuration. This is like a in series configuration, right? Um, if you uh, consider uh, like a, uh, like a variable robots uh, through the lens of design control, and you can observe that, uh, for example, uh, state to art uh, medical robots is this a very famous company called Rewalk, and uh, it has no difference with the conventional industrial robot. Of course, they have different like a shape, morphology, right? But in terms of the basic functionality. It's a very, very, um, uh, even the same as the industrial robot. It's a rigid, uh, high speed, 
and actually non-safe, not very safe, right? And uh, um, in the research community, there are a lot of um, uh, efforts uh, to make robots um, in this dimension to be uh, intelligent, in this dimension to be lightweight and compliant. Um, so uh, in this case, for example, this robot is a smarter because it can help the person uh, running, right? So uh, more versatile. If you think about uh, uh, how to make that mechanically better uh, is uh, this kind of more lightweight uh, uh, exosuit. In my lab, we work on this uh, kind of, like, uh, we call this uh, uh, lightweight, uh, uh, even more lightweight uh, uh, powered exoskeleton. We can dramatically reduce the mass of the, um, this uh, uh, exosuit. Um, and uh, our end goal is to uh, improve uh, mobility by reducing the energetic cost uh, of a person. And also uh, develop a better controller so the uh, robot can not only, uh, you see here in this case, it's uh, only for lab-based running, right? It, it, running on the treadmill. In this case, it's walking or running on the treadmill, right? How can we mix the, uh, the robot really uh, versatile that can um, not, only, not only helping kind of like, uh, walking um, this kind of like scenario, but also uh, sit to stand, running, or kneeling. So there are many, many activities for a human, right? It's not only about walking, right? Yeah, so to make that really versatile. Uh, uh, if we look at, uh, about, look at uh, any uh, power exoskeleton, uh, it has uh, like um, uh, several major components. One is uh, uh, the, the actuator, the motor. Uh, this is the number one kind of component. The second is uh, uh, transmission. So inside the, the, the mode, inside this kind of like a, uh, uh, box, there's also kind of like a gear, uh, gear or belt, different uh, transmission. So that's the second component. So first component is the motor, second is gear belt, those kind of like a transmission. Transmission mechanism. Uh, the third component is uh, this kind of like a variable, variable structure, like uh, this kind of like a uh, uh, kind of like a frame, right? Uh, the person need to uh, the robot will be attached to the person through this frame, right? And also through the uh, brace, right? Those are kind of like the third component, right? So yeah, so for example, here I show the gear and uh, yeah, gear or belt. So. So, so um, if you look at any powered exoskeleton, it's uh, composed uh, of those three key um, uh, components. So uh, actually, I think uh, uh, how to make robots better, right? So from the mechanical perspective, uh, is, uh, could it be make all those components better, right? Make the motor better, make the transmission better, and also make the variable better, right? So you can see, this, uh, I would say, is this, uh, um, uh, you know, this is uh, pretty compact, right? And uh, actually, if you look at many other uh, exoskeletons, they have like a big uh, computer here. Um, the, the overall system is uh, very, very bulky, right? So our uh, robot is uh, more compact, right? Uh, so we are working on to make that even um, uh, smaller. So it ha have a minimal uh, kind of like a, a mass penalty to the user. And uh, the key metric for a variable robot is how much torque it can generate, right? And uh, we certainly want the robot to be very powerful, but on the other end, we also want the robot to be lightweight, right? So those are kind of like a, kind of like a conflicting requirements, right? If it's very powerful, normally it's very heavy, right? So how can we make it a lightweight, right? And a powerful and provide high torque? That, that's the key challenge, right? So we mentioned about the, the, the mass uh, metric, right? We want to make it a, a lightweight. We also talk about the, the top capability, right? So those are kind of like a very difficult to make it both uh, high talk and uh, lightweight, right? So uh, engineering is, is an art about a trade-off, right? How you can um, think about a um, kind of like the trade-off between this and then between uh, 
um, between metric A and the metric B, right? So, so that's the kind of like the, the, uh, uh, the engineering um, uh, work. You always need to think about uh, uh, the trade-off. Uh, it's not very likely that you can make everything better, right? And you, 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 um, normally you have like a two or three or even more uh, metrics, right? And uh, so you need to really think about uh, how to uh, optimize this, right? And uh, for our tether system, uh, the variable structure is um, uh, very lightweight. And uh, the reason we make this tether system is uh, we want to isolate this actuator from the person, right? So, so the overall system is very, uh, even more lightweight, right? In this case, the person only need to uh, kind of, like, uh, we only need to attach the variable to the person. We, 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 uh, the, the actuator is here, right? So he, the person doesn't need to carry an uh, actuator, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is another kind of like anatomy uh, of a powered exoskeleton. We talk about uh, uh, actuator, right? We talk about actuator and uh, motor and the transmission. Inside this uh, actuator, it has a gear, right? We also talk about uh, um, uh, the, the, the mechanical uh, variable st uh, structure, right? And actually, in addition to those kind of like mechanical components, uh, that's also uh, for example, uh, you, there's also this kind of like a, uh, uh, kind of like a software, uh, both the software, this is the software, right? And also the electronics, right? We need a, a microcontroller, a communication uh, kind of like a, um, uh, electronics, and also different kind of sensors, right? Uh, so so it's, it's kind of like a complicated <laughs> uh, system, right? It's, it's not very easy to make those robots, yeah. And uh, uh, from those sensor, for example, from the motion sensor, it's called an MU sensor, uh, initial measurement unit sensor. Uh, we can detect uh, the angular velocity of the person uh, during walking, and uh, you know, uh, de detect the the, 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 the kind of like, uh, um, we can measure the angular velocity and to understand um, uh, for human walking, we call this a uh, gait cycle or gait percentage. Uh, so, because the walking is kind of like a repetitive process, and uh, it starts from like, for example, uh, we call this uh, um, if you if we go back, uh, called a heel strike, right? A heel strike, and uh, then it's kind of like a, a foot flat, right? So, kind of like a, the heel uh, goes from an angled position uh, to a kind of like a flat position. Then um, uh, the next phase is kind of like the the the, the heel off the ground. And the, the the toe of the ground, right? So from the sensor, uh, we can detect those kind of like a, a, a motion, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's why we need those uh, different sensor to do it, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So so uh, because I will make those uh, videos available, uh, those slides available, uh, uh, like. Uh, on, like in the Dropbox, you can more than welcome uh, to, to download and go to watch those videos. And I will quickly maybe uh, uh, go to the next uh, uh, few slides. Um, so uh, talk about the control. So um, as I talked about it, like a force control, uh, you can also consider like a talk control. So one way is a force interaction, the other is a talk interaction, right? Um, those are different from like a position or uh, position-based interaction, right? So the, the, the goal is uh, to, to let the robot to generate some kind of like a talk. So it can physically assist the person uh, to walk, right? And, uh, um, but, but, but to, 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 uh, um, uh, to, to design this kind of controller, right? How, how we come up with the shape of this talk, right? You can think about this kind of like a, um, a sinusoidal uh, talk, or maybe why not is it this way, right? So there could be different talk trajectories um, to help the person to walk, right? But how to come up this kind of like a, sh a shape, right? The, um, the trajectory of the talk is really um, the, the research question. And uh, for example, if I tell you, if you just do this uh, sin uh, sinusoidal uh, signal, What's the problem with the sign signal? 
if the talk is a sign, why it's not uh, good? Do you know why? So if we help a person to walk with a sinusoidal uh, talk, do, do, you, do you like this uh, talk or not? So the, the, the issue is uh, for human walking, right? You don't really have this kind of like a sign signal. It's kind of like a very, uh, um, uh, not a very regular uh, kind of like a, a shape, right? So this sensor signal is not bad, but it's, uh, the problem is not, uh, uh, not really biological uh, talk. So when you, if you wear this kind of like a robot with this kind of like a, uh, because of a human biological talk, it probably look like uh, this, kind of like a very irregular, kind of like a, it's not a, you cannot really easily approximate with uh, some like a, a mass fraction. Yeah, so that, that's, uh, um, uh, it, it's not bad, but it's not uh, perfect, yeah. So, but, but we want to uh, do some kind of modeling and this is what you will learn uh, in the, uh, uh, control system. So just to give you some higher level idea, uh, we can uh, model uh, the interaction. So that's what I call this uh, human robot interaction model. So we can model the interaction to model the uh, from the input, right, and to the output. We have a desired talk, right, a reference talk, reference talk. There's also an actual talk. We want to model from the desired uh, reference talk to the actual talk. They're not the same, right? It's like when you drive a car, when you set up the speed, it's not necessarily the same as uh, the speed you set, right? The desired and the actual talk, they could be very different, right? It, yeah, so it, it's not a very trivial. So, so we model this through this uh, uh, kind of like uh, from the motor model, transmission model, and the variable structure. So those are three components I talked about before. And we found that uh, uh, we, we have this very powerful motor and it can generate high torque. Uh, we call this a quasi direct drive motor. And uh, uh, so it can actually uh, make the system very compliant, right? So that's one advantage. The second advantage is we can have, make it have very high bandwidth. And uh, you see, this is like a high frequency. So no matter how fast you move, the robot can follow your motion, right? The bandwidth means, uh, uh, think about, uh, What's a mechanical bandwidth? Um, mechanical bandwidth is uh, if you, for example, if you move your hand, how fast can you move your hand? In one second, how many seconds you can move it? Like from where to where, like exactly. Yeah, just uh, here, maybe range of like a ninety degree back and forth. Maybe like five, five or six times. Five or six times. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. In so one like... second, you can move five set of times. Yeah, sure. It's like I mean, it's, I know a person that could punch like 20, 10, 20 times in like five seconds. So. Okay, so let, let's say in one second, okay, you can do five times, right? Move the, your hand, uh, uh, wrist back and forth, right? Let's do this way, right? So what's the frequency? Uh, one over five, right? So it'd be like 0. 0.2. 
Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. What's the frequency? It could be five hertz. Right, so this means five hertz, right? So that means uh, you can complete the motion, complete the motion five times, right? Correct? Right? So that's, yeah. a, so the period, right? The T is uh, one divided by five. It's a point two second, right? So the period is, is, is this, right? Uh, one divided by, right? So, 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 so the frequency, right? This, this is called a uh, F, right? So the frequency at five, right? So, but, but uh, how, how, how about a B? How many times can, can B rotate the, uh, flip the wings? Uh, I, I think uh, maybe you don't know, I don't know neither, right? But let's say 100 times, right? 100 times. So what's the frequency for bees to flip the wings? Oh, 100 okay. hertz, right? So, so, so that, that's the definition of, uh, you know, uh, bandwidth, right? So don't take this for granted, right? You have a human have like a, you know, a okay motion bandwidth, right? Animal probably have better bandwidth, right? Motion batteries, right? So that, that's why, uh, if you really think about, uh, you, you know, um, why we need the robot to have high batteries, right? Because uh, if you, if the person does some like a high frequency motion, whether on the robot to be able to follow human motion, right? Uh, let's say if we, the robot only uh, have like a two hertz or three hertz. It's not enough to match this five hertz motion, right? So, so that's why we, we need a high bandwidth uh, motion and a high bandwidth uh, actuator, right? So it, it's not trivial. It's not very easy, right? For human, right? Human, like a muscle actuator, is kind of slow, right? As you mentioned, the five hertz is already <laughs> high speed human actuator, right? But for for me, I probably can do two or three times per second, right? So yeah, so 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 I, I, the point is, uh, I want you to really appreciate that uh, those high bandwidth and actuator is very important. Yeah. So we also show that the robot can really uh, reduce the uh, muscle activity um, dramatically, right? So 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 uh, when the robot is powered on and the, the the human muscle contribution drops, right? So means the human doesn't need to do much work. The robot will do like a seventy percent of work for you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, um, I will not go over all the details. Uh, you are more than welcome to check this kind of like a, a robot controller uh, slides. And uh, so you don't have to understand all the details. Uh, the goal is for you to have like a high level uh, concept, right? For, for human, we have the stance and the swing face. And uh, uh, the goal is we want to estimate the human uh, joint talk. So for example, you see the ground truth talk this uh, uh, solid line and the estimated talk is a dashed line. Um, we, we do this by adding this kind of like, a, uh, kind of like a, uh, during human walking, we approximate human talk, right? You see the, 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 the vertical uh, axis is a, a joint moment or joint talk, right? It's a combination of this, uh, like a, you can think about it like a spring, right? When human walking, this causes the dense face. So when, you, when the foot is on, on the ground, one limb is on the ground. Um, but uh, when the limb is, uh, for example, in this case, the limb is uh, uh, has a contact with the ground, right? When the foot is off the ground, right? In this case, it's called a, uh, called a kind of like a, a swing face, right? Uh, uh, and it's kind of like a, uh, the right limb, if you look at the right limb, is in the air, right? It's called a, a swing face, right? In this case, uh, it, it, it will have this kind of like a, uh, like a smaller uh, stiffness. If you think about it as a two spring, this is a high stiffness, uh, stiffness spring, right? This is a low stiffness spring, right? So yeah, in this way, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the simple idea is uh, we combine the torque 
from the high stiff spring and the low stiff spring, right? We put them together, right? So that's how we have this kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a stance plus swing, right? So torque one plus torque two is equal uh, this torque, right? So you can consider that two components. This uh, kind of like a one, this is a second component, right? So the second component, uh, so the first com component is from this uh, kind of like a blue, the stance is from the uh, swing, right? So kind of like, a, yeah. So kind of like a simple idea. You, you, you don't have to understand this, but I'll just uh, tell you some like a simple idea. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, and uh, my student will take over. And um, so uh, he, he will give you, give you some uh, uh, more content about this lecture. So the uh, one thing I, I want to remind you that is uh, I think still uh, some students have not signed up uh, for this uh, I don't know kit uh, like uh, either you buy it yourself or you borrow it from us. I think there's only uh, 17 students here, but uh, for the uh, remaining students, you need to uh, choose uh, how you want to get. The Arduino kit. So, because for uh, starting from uh, next week's lab, uh, no, the week after next, we will be, uh, you will be required to have the actual physical kit in order to, to in order to attend the lab session. So, if you have not uh, chosen an option so far, uh, please uh, do so right now. And uh, for those who have chosen to buy it yourself, uh, have you all received the kit? Yes. Okay, yes. That's, okay, that's great. Uh, and uh, one more thing that for the uh, groups, uh, could you please uh, like, uh, chose, uh, choose one leader for each group so that I only need to uh, contact the leader and the leader will uh, uh, distribute the task among the uh, group members. Uh, can you see my share screen? Yeah. Uh, okay, because some students said he, they cannot see the screen, I'm not sure why. So uh, please uh, nominate a leader for each group. And uh, for next week, uh, we will be having the first, uh, next week, uh, February 24th, uh, we will be having the first uh, student presentations uh, on the uh, soft robots. And uh, I believe you have all, uh, go through the uh, materials that we have sent you uh, like, uh, two or three weeks earlier. And uh, um, uh, for, for each uh, lecture, one group will be chosen to do the presentation. So uh, for uh, next week's presentation, uh, uh, group two, uh, can you uh, do these presentations? So basically you just uh, uh, use your videos and use your slides and uh, present to the, your fellow students uh, during the lecture. And uh, I will give you some comments uh, and feedback. Uh, group two, is that okay? For next week's presentation. Uh, I think group two is uh, Andy, uh, Chanel, Gary, Vikash, uh, Eric. Okay, sure. Yeah, that's, that works for me. 
Yeah, so um, so these are for the uh, uh, groups and the Arduino kits. Uh, and if you want to uh, borrow it from us, then you need to uh, schedule with us, send us an email to pick up the uh, kit from the uh, Marsh Access building uh, at the front door. We will meet you there. Okay. Um, And uh, yeah, it's uh, here, the front, we will meet you here at the front door of the March of San uh, And- uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, for the presentations, is there a grading criteria or is it just, we're gonna receive your feedback on it? Um, yes, uh, your uh, final grade, uh, one part of the final grade is uh, your presentations. So um, we will judge you all, for example, the IFD presentation covers uh, most of the material we provided. If it's uh, the uh, logic is uh, clear and uh, this kind of stuff. So it's, we, we, will be, uh, okay, we will not be very harsh on, on your uh, presentation because we understand it's uh, a new topic for you guys. Okay, thank, but, thank you. Yes, no problem. Uh, any other questions? Um, so for other groups, please remember to uh, submit your uh, slides uh, or your uh, uh, video presentations um, uh, before uh, February 24th. And uh, using this link here, to submit the file. Uh, okay, so for the uh, remaining of this lecture, I would like to show you a, uh, a, uh, a talk by uh, Professor Steve Pollins from the Stanford University. Okay. Uh, so let me optimize this one for a second. And improve human mobility, and particularly for people with disabilities that affect the lower limbs, like amputation, or for people who have to walk long distances, like soldiers. And today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research uh, strategy and some of our recent results and future directions. And I use three complementary approaches. First, we develop new tools to speed and systematize the design of prosthesis and ankylosis. Uh, we call these universal device emulators. Second, we leverage emulators to perform basic scientific experiments aimed at discovering and characterizing the effects of new assistance strategies. And third, we take successful approaches and try to translate them into mobile devices with a focus on highly energy efficient robotics. So let's start with emulators and why does it make sense to develop these tools? I think a good way to explain this is by pointing out some of the problems with the traditional approach and I'll use my, uh, my own first foray into prosthetics as an example. And I actually got started in prosthetics because of an interest in walking robots a long time ago as an undergraduate student at Cornell University where I, uh, I designed and built this very energy efficient walking robot based on passive dynamics. One of the keys to the success of the device is that it uses a trailing ankle push-off work strategy. So the hips and knees are unpowered. The only way that energy is injected into the system is that once per step, the trailing ankle uh, pushes off, it, it plantar flexes under torque, and that adds mechanical energy to the system. When I became a graduate student, I wanted to apply this idea in a way that was more directly beneficial to people. Looking around, we noticed that people typically use these passive elastic prostheses and have lower ankle push-off work. So we thought 
that this could help explain why people with amputation experience a 20% to 100% increase in metabolic rate to get from one point to another. So we designed a prosthesis intended to increase ankle push-up force. Now one way to do that would be to take a motor, stick it on the joint, and actively drive it. Uh, but we thought it would be clever instead to capture energy normally dissipated during walking and then recycle it to augment ankle push-up. So we designed a prosthesis to do just that. <coughs> it has a large energy storing spring. When you step on the heel, the spring presses, capturing energy. It's then held in place with a clutch. Later, a separate latch on the toe releases, and the, uh, when the spring recoils, it is returned during this push-up phase and increases ankle force. We performed experiments on people wearing the device and found that, indeed, as intended, it captured energy and returned it during push-off, and that restored ankle push-off to normal levels. But everything was looking great, but we were about to be confronted with the first problem with the traditional design approach in this domain, which is that usually it does not work. Uh, in this case, we wanted to see a reduction in metabolic rate. Instead, we saw an increase in metabolic rate by 70%. And in my conversations with other designers of prostheses and exoskeletons, I can tell you this happens most of the time, maybe 90% of the time. Uh, <coughs> now, if you're anything like me, you probably have some ideas about how to change our device to improve the results, right? But you're about to be confronted by the second problem with the traditional design approach, which is that uh, this tool that we developed is very bad at testing those ideas. So something I didn't tell you is that it took us five years between having the idea for the device and having something robust enough for testing in humans. And we were confronted with tight constraints on energy cost and, uh, and size and mass. And so we ended up with something that's very specialized. It does the one thing we had in mind and nothing else. So any change you want to make to this device is going to take realistically on the order of years. Compounding this problem, it turns out that little differences in device function can have a big impact on high-level performance. For example, when uh, we put little pieces of little wedges of foam underneath the foot, it felt like it was a little easier to walk. And this inspired a, a side project where we just changed the rollover shape of a foot. And we found that indeed with too flat or too curved a foot, you could nearly double the energy cost of walking. If we go back and look at the two devices that we compared in our study, you'll see that there are many such differences, right? Uh, this is a, a Seattle light foot, a very commonly used prosthesis, and this is our energy recycling foot. There are differences in heel length and stiffness, damping properties, a dozen other features that could be responsible for the observed changes in high level performance. So worst of all, after our experiment, we don't even know whether energy recycling is beneficial, right? We haven't performed a controlled test of whether that functionality is beneficial to a human. <coughs> so these subtle little differences in device features can have a big impact on performance. A related problem is that the changes that they cause in biomechanics are also subtle. And as a fun illustration of this fact, we're gonna have some quizzes today. <coughs> this is the first. And in each case, you're going to see a video of a person. Uh, is it possible to dim the lights a little bit, Jared? Okay. Thanks. So you're going to see a video of a person walking with a device operating in two different, slightly different ways. And I'm going to ask you a question about what's going on. So in this case, we have a person wearing an ankle exoskeleton that is uh, uh, on one leg that's behaving slightly differently. And what I want you to do is look at the way they're walking and tell me in which case are they expending more energy? Which case are they working harder? And you're gonna have three choices. You're gonna do a show of hands. You can say one side or the other side, or they're equal, okay? So take a moment, look at the person walking, form your opinion. Do you have it? Okay, so show of hands. More energy on left side. More energy on right side. Equal, good test taker. Oh, oh, well, usually I don't get very many people biting on that one. But <coughs> turns out 25% higher energy cost on the left side. 
right? So we had about a 50-50 split. This is typical. 25% uh, higher cost. This is a big change. That's equivalent to carrying a backpack with 25% of your body weight in it. So like a 45-pound backpack for me. You're going to notice that, right? But it's really hard to see the biomechanical changes responsible for that big change in output. <coughs> so looking back over this, this approach and, and some of the problems with it, I was struck by a couple of, of things. First, we need intuition. We need simple models. We need observations from biomechanics to inspire intervention. But we should not expect them to work the first time, right? People are very complicated, and it's difficult to predict what kinds of, uh, how people will respond to different interventions. And so I think what we need to do is experiment and then do lots of experiments in rapid iteration. The second thing is that the, the primary factor limiting the speed with which we can do those experiments are the experimental tools we're using. These product-like prototypes, they're cumbersome, and they're the rate limiting factor. So when I became a professor, I set out to uh, design a new way of developing new tools based on universal device emulators. The basic idea here is to take a process that usually requires years and compress it down to days. You can do lots test lots of ideas really quickly. And simultaneously, to about allow better experimental protocols, so we'll have more foundational insights into the relationship between functionality of the device and the response of the user. Uh, we have a lot of design people around here. I've been having conversations with them today, I think, who think about this as sort of the needs finding problem, but in biomechanics. You can't just ask a person what the device should do. This is our way of trying to discover that. Once we uh, figure out what our mobile devices should do, then we can translate it into an autonomous device. <coughs> All right, so emulators, what am I talking about? Let me tell you about some of our systems. They typically have three main components, powerful off-board motor and control hardware, lightweight instrumented end effectors worn on the leg, and a flexible tether connecting the two. Having this powerful off-board hardware means we're not limited by actuation and processing. So this is a two, these are a couple of two kilowatt AC servo motors, weighs 30 kilograms, but it's off your body. A lot of input. Over here we have a many gigahertz real-time processor, lots of I.O. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Decoupling these things also makes the end effectors simple and lightweight. So if you're not accustomed to the design of these kinds of things, maybe this looks complicated, but it's just a few pieces of aluminum, a revolute joint, an encoder to measure to an angle, strain gauges or uh, spring deflection measurement to get the torque. And you end up with something that weighs, this is about one kilogram, a little less than one kilogram, about a third of the mass of other powered processes. <coughs> we use these devices as uh, to, to give people the physical experience of interacting with some virtual device. So they're kind of like a haptic interface, if you like. High quality torque control is therefore very important. And over the years we've developed uh, an approach that we like we control motor velocity as a function of three terms. First, there's a, a proportional term on the torque error, which gives us reactivity on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Then we have uh, a damping term based on the motor speed for stability. And finally, there's an iterative learning term, which provides model-free feed-forward compensation. And this is especially good in a, a complex system that's hard to model, like our emulator and the human that's attached to it, that has a cyclic behavior like walking. And it corrects the kinds of torque errors that tend to occur at the same point on every cycle. We performed a, a bunch of uh, tests. I won't bore you with all the details uh, to, to uh, verify the, the mechatronic performance of these systems, like torque measurement error, step responses, closure torque control bandwidth, disturbance rejection bandwidth, peak velocity, peak speed, and the quality of torque control under a, a wide variety of circumstances uh, during interactions with people. And by all of these measures, we find that our systems indeed have exceptional performance. And it's because we've tethered them to really powerful off-board hardware. Another way to see whether things are working well is to emulate a device that someone is accustomed to working with and then ask them, what does this feel like? And when we do that, our amputees tell us, oh, this feels just like a satch foot that I used to wear. Oh, this feels like my prescribed Seattle light foot or whatever. So that's another good sign that it's working. So we take all this together 
and we have accomplished our goal. We have really versatile tools for uh, experiments. Is that a question or just no? Okay. <coughs> Yeah, the, the torques we care about are like 100 to 150 newton meters, so it's you know a couple percent, right? To de I, and depending on how complex and how challenging the tracking is, maybe five percent error in the worst case. Uh, another cool thing about this is that once you've solved the offboard problem, making new end effectors becomes easier. For example, this is a device with two independently controlled toes. Uh, when you move them together, you get something like plantar flexing. And when you move them in the opposite directions, you get something like inversion eversion. So you can use this to probe balance in the frontal plane. Uh, and here's another set of end effectors that uh, these are ankle exoskeletons we used to look at augmentation of uh, intact people and uh, people who had a stroke. <coughs> Looking forward, uh, we plan to continue to develop more end effectors to increase the kinds of interventions we can explore, for example, knee exoskeletons and prostheses, uh, multi-actuated prosthetic feet, and ultra-lightweight exoskeletons for fast running, as you can see up here. We'd like to get a complete lower limb system in the next few years. We're also looking at other modalities. For example, uh, this device uses pressurized air to shoot big steel balls into the chamber worn on the ankle so that we can uh, into and out of the chamber on the ankle, so we can change the mass of the leg by a couple kilograms in less than a second, which is fun. And finally, we're looking at um, in emulating aspects of the environment. Uh, this is a push bot, which can provide tugs and trips in various ways unexpectedly during walking. And we'd like to use this to develop assessments of balance. One way to see how stable a person is is to shove them harder and harder until they fall down. <laughs> and as assuming we can get IOB approval, <laughs> that will be a lot of fun. But I, I think that the direction that I'm most excited about here is commercial translation. So a former PhD student of mine, uh, Josh Picudo, has started a company, Human Motion Technologies, and has already made a couple of sales of our emulator systems to other laboratories. And I'd like to see it in hundreds of laboratories around the world giving people who don't have a robotics background, maybe they're in kinesiology or neuroscience or more clinical backgrounds, the ability to try out their crazy ideas for robotic prosthesis behavior or exoskeletal behavior. I think this will really accelerate progress in the field. And we also have ideas about ways that we can put these in a clinical setting and then improve the process of prescription so people get devices that they like better and also simultaneously gather quantitative data to justify those prescriptions to insurance carriers, which has become a real problem in, uh, uh, in recent years for O&P sectors. <coughs> which brings us to our second case. So here we have a, an individual with unilateral transtibular amputation. He's walking with our emulator as it emulates two commercially available prosthetic feet. In this case, I'd like you to tell me which mode they prefer? Which do they like better? So you can have the same choices, one side, the other side, or equal. All right, have you formed your opinion? All right. <coughs> We're looking for the one that they prefer. Who thinks? Show of hands. Left. Right. Equal? <laughs> Turns out they strongly prefer the device on the right. This is a, <laughs> yeah, we, we, and, and we did better than chance there. I think there were more hands for the, for the right, but not a lot better. Uh, so this was on a scale of negative 10 to positive 10, where negative 10 is the worst prosthesis you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and zero is my prescribed foot. So they really hated this condition on the left. And <coughs> Just goes to show these very subtle changes. You can kind of see that it's flexing a little bit less. And in this case, there's a little more excursion of the ankle joint. So these subtle little things have a big impact on the foot. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of our talk where we'll talk about how those changes in device function relate to high level performance. And uh, in this case, I'd like to start off coming back to push off work. But this time, we have an emulator system. 
So we can vary ankle push off in isolation. Everything else about the device is held constant, and we can do it with a huge range. So here we have a plot of um, push off work. We've got on the x axis percent stride, that's normalized time. On the y axis, we have ankle joint power. This dotted line corresponds to normal ankle function during walking at this speed. And each of these curves corresponds to a condition that we applied at the end there. You can see we're going from half of the push off work to two and a half times the push off work that the ankle normally performs. When we uh, tested this with people with a unilateral transtibular amputation, to our surprise, we found that as we varied push off work over a huge range, there was essentially no change in metabolic rate. This goes against our intuition, goes against simple model predictions, even some more complex model predictions. And it, it tells us that push-off work could be a necessary component of improving energy economy with these kinds of devices, but it's not sufficient. There must be something else going on. Uh, and that tells us, that, that invites us to reconsider our understanding of why passive devices result in higher energy costs and the mechanisms by which the one commercially available robotic prosthesis does reduce energy costs. And I think it may have something to do with balance and control, which I'll come back to in a moment. <coughs> Another fun thing about this study is it allows us to directly test some of the predictions of simple models. The mechanism by which the simple models predict that as you increase energy uh, uh, trailing limb push off, you should decrease energy cost is through uh, a reduction in leading limb collision. So as the leading leg hits, if the trailing limb is pushing off just before it hits, less energy dissipated. In our experiment, we varied trailing limb push off over a big range, factor of two range, but no change in leading limb collision rate. <coughs> So this, again, underlines the difficulty of predicting how people will respond to our interventions, especially with models that are a lot simpler than the human. Okay, the second uh, established line of research I want to talk about uh, touches on balance. And here we have some more promising results. So in this case, our inspiration came from a model we developed where we compared different ways of stabilizing the system against disturbances like random variations in floor height or side-to-side -side pushes. In particularly, uh, in particular, we wanted to know, can ankle control meaningfully improve balance compared to foot placement? Because everybody knows that foot placement is essential to human balance. What we found, to our surprise, was that ankle, uh, modulating ankle push-off work on a step-by-step -step basis could actually do just as well as foot placement. And in some conditions, it did better than foot placement. So uh, inspired by this, we implemented a simplified version of our controller in our emulator, and we tried a bunch of variations quickly. And the, the control law uh, is basically this. Um, as you're transitioning to your next step, if your side-to-side -side velocity is a little bit less than normal, you push off hard. And if your side-to-side -side velocity is a little bit more than normal, you push off less. And what we found is that this reduces foot placement variability associated with active control of uh, foot placement for balance and metabolic rate, which we were pretty excited about. This is, um, the, you know, the differences aren't about the average behavior between conditions which were identical. Uh, so this is the first example of improving energy economy with a device that improves balance. And we've this was uh, this data is published. It's based on people using uh, a plus, uh, an amputation simulating boot. But we've s uh, since then, we've uh, completed the protocol with amputees and found actually a bigger effect, about an 11% reduction in metabolic rate when we helped their balance. <coughs> We're also looking at other ways of improving balance. One of the things that amputees complain most about in surveys is an inability to walk on uneven ground, <coughs> uh, like out in the field, because you get these unexpected torques on your foot. And you, you can't really feel what the ground is like under your foot. And there is a lack of compliance in that direction. So uh, we've been developing a new control algorithm to try to compensate for ground irregularities. We call it ground-mastered control. When the heel first strikes the 
first use the toes to sense the shape of the ground, so we'll do some kind of like whiskers. And then after we know what the ground shape is, we use that information uh, in a uh, quasi-passive behavior th for the rest of the step. And what we find, this is just got a couple, this is hot off the presses, just a couple subjects of the protocol, but here's some data for one subject where uh, they, when we put blocks on the treadmill, they perceive that their balance is a lot worse. <coughs> Uh, but when we put blocks on the treadmill, when they're using our ground matching control uh, mode, the, cha their, the perception of the reduction in the balance is a lot smaller. So it's a, a big improvement, and we're excited about this type of thing. We performed a lot of other experiments that I won't have time to go into here. Uh, in most cases, we take some feature that we think will be beneficial. We vary it over a wide range in isolation, and we measure high level benefits in terms of energy costs, stability, and subjective outcomes. <coughs> this is something we, we plan to continue doing uh, with the aim of sort of mapping out this uh, space and uh, enabling the rational design of mobile devices. The next way we're leveraging these emulators is in human in the loop optimization. And uh, this is ongoing work. What do I mean by human in the loop optimization? Here we're measuring something about human performance on, on in, in real time, feeding that information back to our controller, changing the behavior of the device, and doing that in a systematic way to try to improve performance or change the person's coordination pattern in some desired way. And this is potentially very powerful for several reasons. Uh, first, it addresses the problem that hopefully I've established that we're not very good at discovering effective assistance strategies, so this can find them for us. Second is that there are big differences between individuals, and this can yield, uh, lead to individualized control and assistance. And third, people are not static. They change, they learn about the device, they grow and adapt, and this means our devices can keep up with them. So I'm going to tell you, I have five PhD students working on different approaches to this problem in my lab right now. I'll tell you about a couple in detail. Uh, the first is has application to prescription of devices. <coughs> and the idea here is to use a relatively simple interface that would be applicable in a clinical setting to try to uh, discover the kind of device that a person likes best quickly. And we're using an approach of handing the patient the control. So here we have a uh, subject walking on a treadmill, they have a joystick in one hand, they have these little sliders up here, they don't know what they mean, they tick t different sliders, they change the settings, um, and as they do, they're navigating this parameter space. This is compressed, each one of these runs is about two to four minutes. And what we see is uh, they choose a combination of alignment and stiffness and stiffening versus softening characteristics of the device is very consistent across the distance. So people are actually pretty good at this already, which is nice. We can leverage the human optimizer. And then when we do a validation trial, we're finding that people indeed prefer the settings that they selected, even if we not just, just move one tick in any direction in the parameter, which is great. So we think that a, a clinician-mediated version of this might be used in a, a, a clinic to help improve performance. Uh, another strategy that we're investigating aimed at augmentation is based on a heuristic. And here what we're doing is we're <coughs> assuming that when you have activity in your muscles, you want torque from the device for assistance. And so on each step, we measure EMG, and then we add a scaled version of it to desired torque. And this occurs over hundreds of steps. And you can see over time, the person's muscle activity is decreasing and the torque applied by the device is slowly increasing. And note that this is not the same as just taking a snapshot of their EMG and then playing that back because it's occurring slowly over time. So the person is adapting to the device and the device is adapting to the person at the same time. There's co-adaptation. And one of the cool things about this is that you can, uh, and you know, we're getting energy cost reductions about 10, 10, 15 percent with one thing on one leg, which is good. That's good compared to other results so far. 
And uh, the, the cool thing about this is that we're actually optimizing hundreds of parameters here. And the way we're able to navigate the space is by treating them as linearly independent optimization problems for each instance of time. Yes? Uh, we're using two muscles at the moment. So we're using Soleus and TA. And we're using, we're actually, the TA is an antagonist. So we're uh, subtracting out TA from the flow. Yeah. <coughs> Torque at the ankle joint. Right. So if you had biarticular muscles, you would probably want to do something more complicated where you have. In this case, it's always positive. Yes. Uh, but you can imagine that the approach would apply to exoskeletons that span lots of joints and using lots of muscle activity data online. So you could potentially have somebody put on a very complicated exoskeleton and walk with it for 10 minutes and have an individualized assistance controller really quickly, which is cool. And this is a really general solution. <coughs> We're looking at a bunch of other methods that uh, I won't go into in detail, ordinal SVM, simplex circuit, genetic algorithms based on fast estimated metabolic rate, system identification methods where we ID the person's response to device behavior, then use that information to decide what inputs to give with the exoskeleton to drive them to some desired state, things like that. And I'm, I'm, I think that over the next few years, we're really gonna do some foundational work in what, what I think will become a, an important subfield in wearable robotics. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is an area of future work, and it relates to uh, predictive musculoskeletal models. So the one of the dreams in musculoskeletal modeling for a long time has been, uh, can we predict how people will respond to some new mechanical interaction, some new device? And this would be a boon to designers because we could compress the time down from days now down to seconds to get an evaluation of the effectiveness of some, some dreamed up uh, device. But I probably have managed to convince you that this is very hard, very challenging problem. And I think that what we need, uh, something that would help us make progress here is more training data. And these emulator systems are great for generating that training data. So the, the sort of cycle I would imagine is musculoskeletal simulations generate good experiments to perform. Experimental data is fed back into the simulation and then we uh, both improve the predictive validity of the simulation while simultaneously discovering new assistant strategies. And I've done a little bit of work in this direction with um, Manoj Srinivasan at Ohio State University and this is something I'd like to do more of in the future. <coughs> Which brings us to our third and final quiz. Last chance to get it right. Now in this case, you can probably tell the difference between the two videos. You, s you see it, right? You so uh, the question now is not which is different, but rather it's a quantitative question. How much harder is it to walk with your arms swinging in the opposite direction as normal? How much harder? <coughs> and we need a number here. I'm looking for a percentage increase in energy cost. Do we have any brave guessers? Any volunteers? Yes, sir. 38% higher. 12% higher. 100%, 200%. Okay, well it turns out it's a 25% increase in energy cost. So splitting the difference, you guys are pretty close, yeah. Uh, again, a huge increase. When I saw this result, my just, <coughs> my head exploded. I mean, your arms do not bear any load during walking. Your hands do not touch the ground usually, right? Uh, <coughs> hopefully. Uh, people have argued that arm swinging is vestigial, that it's just a, a, a neural relic from when we were quadrupeds. But it turns out actually normal arm swinging is an essential part of economic gait. And so hopefully I've managed with these illustrations to convince you just how hard it is to predict how people will respond. 
All right, in the last part of my talk, I'd, I'd like to discuss translation to mobile devices. And here, um, the, the successful strategies we've discovered so far are just reaching the point where we're ready to, to translate them. So I don't have very interesting results to talk about. Instead, I'd like to talk about some translation that's based on earlier basic scientific research, particularly work in the mid-aughts by a group um, uh, and reported in a paper in Chicago et al. 2009. And uh, so this is, this is what inspired the study I'm going to describe. Um, this group showed, they used ultrasonography of the calf muscle to show <coughs> that while the ankle joint produces more positive work during walking than any other group, most of that work is done by elastic recoil of tendons. And this is a, you can see this is the power, and this is the contribution of the tendon according to their study. And that the, the muscles themselves, the muscle fascicles, remain largely isometric, especially in early and mid stance. They're holding one end of the spring as it says there. But we know that muscles consume energy whenever they're active, even if they're not doing positive things. So my, uh, my colleague and friend, Greg Kawiki, who's now at North Carolina State University, and I, we saw this as grad students and thought, what if we put a clutch in parallel with the calf muscle and a spring in parallel with the Achilles tendon? Maybe we can offload the calf muscles and reduce the energy that they consume a little bit. <coughs> now, we wouldn't want to compliant a spring, otherwise it would do nothing. If we make the spring too stiff, it'll probably interfere with normal ankle motions, but maybe there's a sweet spot where it makes walking work. So we uh, built a device that does that, and here I'm gonna walk you through how it works. We're gonna look at this leg in the foreground, and <coughs> uh, during swing, the ankle can move freely. At the end, just before the heel strikes, this clutch engages, and then there's a tensioning spring that picks up slack holding the other end of the string while the spring stretches and generates a plantar flexion force. Then at the end of the step, it recoils and the clutch disengages and you can move the ankle freely during the swing. Or to put that more simply, when your foot is on the ground, the spring is engaged. When your foot is in the air, the spring is disengaged so you can move the foot. When we uh, tested this on people, we found that muscle activity in the soleus decreased particularly during early and mid stance, as we had wanted. And we found that energy cost also was decreased for a moderate stance spring. With uh, just at the sweet spot, we got an energy cost reduction of about 7%. We were very excited about this result because people have been trying to reduce the energy cost of walking for more than 100 years. And it's only been in the last couple years that any devices have reduced energy cost. Uh, and there's a handful of devices that uh, uh, to, to date. Uh, and in those cases, it was always with very high power devices where the energy input from the device greatly outstripped the savings for the person. So it made the uh, gait less efficient, actually. Because this is an unpowered device, it actually makes the human pulsation and skeleton system more efficient. Or to be more provocative about it, people have been evolving to be efficient walkers for seven million years and we just beat out evolution a little bit. <coughs> so the last part of the talk, I, I'd like to talk about a technology that we could use to make these unpowered exoskeletons into a product and also has application to a wide variety of wearable devices. One of the problems with our unpowered clutch is that it engages and disengages based on joint angle and, and some history. So you have to hand tune it and it may work well at one speed but not another and the spring stiffness might be right for walking but not running. So we'd like to be able to control these things better. <coughs> Over the last couple of years, we have been investigating a new type of clutch that's electrically controllable but still lightweight and low power. It is composed of these flexible electrodes, this is aluminum sputtered mylar, with a dielectric coating. And we uh, place the two electrodes on top of each other like this and hold them in place with tensioning springs. When no voltage is applied, they slide freely past each other. When we apply a voltage, they withstand large shear forces. If 
we put a, there you can go, with some large gear forces. We put a, a, a spring in series, and now we have a system very similar to the one from the other LUT. If we put several clutch springs in parallel, now we can select the overall stiffness of the device. <coughs> if we put this on an exoskeleton as a demonstration during a dynamic task like walking, you can see the spring stretching there when it's engaged and the joint sliding freely when it's disengaged. <coughs> and had people had uh, one subject walk on the treadmill for a few hundred steps. We used a very similar control pattern as with the unpowered exoskeleton. Just when the heel strikes, we start waiting for maximum plantar flexion, then engage the clutch. A large torque is developed over the course of stance, and then we disengage the clutch and get no torque during jerk. So the performance characteristics of this clutch are, are pretty strong. Uh, it can withstand about 100 newtons. The mass of the electrodes is a little less than two grams. The power consumed is less than one milliwatt to cycle it at one hertz. So these are order of magnitude improvements over conventional electromagnetic and magnetorheological clutches. Uh, the applied voltage is 240 volts, which might sound like a lot, uh, but it's actually rather low. Um, it's uh, two to four times lower than a lot of the electrostatic systems used for, say, wall climbing robots. And that has a couple of advantages. One is you can use conventional electronics, so you could put this in a compact mobile device. And another is that you avoid problems with space charge, which can prevent things from automatically releasing when the voltage changes. And that's perhaps part of the reason we get pretty good adhere and release times, about 30 milliseconds each. Everything you see over here is about 26 grams, and the whole thing has a resiliency of about 95%. <coughs> so we're really excited about this technology, and it opens up uh, a cool new space of designs where you can have lots of independently controlled clutches in one system. And you could use that not only for this selectable stiffness device I described earlier, but other kind of crazy things that we've had rattling around in the back of our minds for a little while. Something I'm particularly excited about is a new type of energy recycling actuator. So the, the functionalities that I want and have wanted for a long time is this. Big energy swirling spring, CVT in series with your object. You can imagine if the spring is stretched a little bit, then you can get any force you want by changing the ratio of the CVT. And then you can port energy into and out of the spring with force control. <coughs> and this is especially beneficial in tasks like walking, where if you're going at steady speed on a level surface, there's no uh, energy input is required. It's the energy, the mechanical energy system isn't changing over time, right? So the ability to capture energy in a controlled way and then return it in a controlled way could be really helpful. The problem is that CVTs for robotics are terrible, right? They're heavy, they're big, they're bulky, they're uh, lossy, they don't like to shift at zero speed. What if instead we use clutches? So here we have just two clutches uh, where we can have two forces on our output. One would be if we clutch the spring to the output, we get some force. In the other case, we clutch the spring to the ground, and then we get no force on the output. But we don't lose any of the energy stored in the spring. Okay, well, that's two force settings. That's not enough. What if we put a bunch of clutches together or a whole lot of clutches together? Now we have uh, a discreetly variable transmission between an output and a set of energy storage points. So we could get the benefits of energy storage and return with the controllability of a conventional electric motor in the spring. So I'm very excited about this new stuff. Um, I think some combination of our electrostatic clutch, the basic characterization experiments that we're now performing, and applications to multi-clutch systems like this will probably be the subject of our next big publication. Okay, so uh, before I stop, let me just thank the students who did most of the work. Uh, Josh Caputo, who built our first emulators and now is president of Human Motion Technologies. Uh, 
just just going to single out a few people whose work were uh, was most represented in this talk. Uh, Stuart Diller, who's led our Alexa C6 Plus work. Rachel Jackson, who's led our uh, work with Powered Exit Skeletons. Myung Hee Kim, who's led our balanced augmentation work. Robbie Casada, who conducted a study on anti keys, uh, where we varied uh, push off work. Kirby Witte, who's led the design of our exoskeleton system. And JJ Zhang, who's led our control hardware work. Also, I'd like to thank my sponsors, especially uh, NSF. And thank you for your time. Okay, so I think uh, we don't uh, need to go through the remaining of this video. And uh, now just there are only five minutes to uh, 10.50, so you are free to leave. And if you have any questions, I will stay here for another about five minutes, okay? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Professor. I have a Wait. quick question about the yeah. presentation. So mm -hmm. let's say if your group is selected to go for the week, could yes. you just play the video that you recorded? Or would you have to like present in class? Uh, we prefer that you present in class. All right, so then you would also have to record it if, you were uh, if you're presenting? No, if you're presenting, you don't need to record because we will record the lecture for you, right? So oh, if, okay. Yeah. So okay, you're going to you. record yourself, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. No problem. Bye.